Welcome to the Timescales Interviews. This interview is being conducted in the United States and the United Kingdom. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Doctor Who author and artist, the extraordinary Theo. Hi, Theo. How are you doing today? Hi, Greg. I'm really good. Thank you. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. Am I correct that you're currently located in Bristol, England? Yes. So I currently live in Bristol, but work. Um, I have a kind of non-creative job to keep the bills going. So I, I do sometimes commute to London. So occasionally <clears throat> I talk about London and Bristol in my tweets. So yeah, but Bristol at the moment is where I'm based. Okay. And uh, I it's morning there. I guess it would be about 8.08. It is about 8.08, yep. exactly 8.08. <laughs> yep, which puts it just after midnight here. And this sets a yeah. record. I don't believe I've ever interviewed anybody this late <laughs> or this early in the morning. <laughs> so, Well, thank I'm, you for having me so early. Oh, and thank or you. Or late. <laughs> and thank you for your generosity. I, I'm so happy that I was able to catch up to you. Um Sophie Isles is a name that people will recognize in the worlds of Doctor Who in capacities from fandom to charity works to professional productions, some including uh, Big Finish that we all love. And tonight we're going to touch briefly on each of these areas. So to begin with, Theo, are you a fan of that quirky little British sci-fi drama? What was it called? Doctor Who? <laughs> very much so yeah I'm, I'm a pretty big fan I'd say um yeah um trying to think about when I got into it and that sort of thing um which I suppose is what you'd ask me next um I I'm not the average fan of my age group so I'm I'm 32 which I know is young to some Doctor Who fans and older to others but well I started watching Doctor Who when I was 18 maybe closer to 19 I was a late bloomer in that way and it was all because my my parents weren't very into genre television so I we watched more soaps we watched more um just like casual like game shows panel shows that sort of thing was definitely what we'd watch and then I went to university and I was suddenly allowed to watch whatever I wanted to watch. There we you go. Know? Nice. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that, that's interesting. So I watched bits and pieces. I think at the time um, there was a show that I remember being popular, which was um, Being Human. Um, which I think um, but Being Human, which were, came out in 2000. I think it was 2008. It came out in the autumn because it came out around the same time Halloween, which is about a vampire, a werewolf and a ghost, which I believe has a US version. Um, and what and was that called again? Being human. Being human. Okay. Yeah. So I it check was. That um, out. Yeah, it was. It was basically. It's basically a kind of comedy drama, like a supernatural drama about these three people coexisting in a house, which would be normally an interesting pr uh, premise anyway. But then it was a ghost, a vampire, and a werewolf living in a house, and it was set in <laughs> Bristol, where I'd just gone to university. So, um, and I think from there where I was finally watching stuff that I was interested in, you know, I was able to kind of let loose. A few of my university friends were like, oh, have you ever watched Doctor Who? And I knew about it in passing. I had friends at um, primary school and secondary, no, not primary school, secondary school, who had watched it and had little Dalek figurines and all that stuff, but it never caught my interest. I hmm. you know no one had ever sold it to me as a, this is a, a Theo show to watch. But it was my university friends who were like, oh, well, there's a new one on for the autumn because they're doing specials at the moment. Why don't you come watch it with us? So I ended up watching my first full episode of Doctor Who, not just a clip or a trailer or a passing comment was The Waters of Mars, <laughs> uh, okay. which is um, the, the Time Lord Victorious uh, big announcement, David Tennant going off the rails, this very spooky, very creepy um kind of the, the hot basically what I term as like one of the most horror themed dog two episodes of that era um and uh yeah I left it going that was balmy I need to know more about this show because <laughs> I I because my friends were like oh what this has happened and that the doctor would never do that and were like they had all their own ideas about 
how David Tennant was acting. And they were like, oh, you should definitely go and watch the rest if you like this one. And I was like, well, I did. I was just confused, but in like a <laughs> intrigued way, you know, not in a, I don't understand, I'm turning it off. More of a, I don't understand, I want to be in the know. And that led mm-hmm. me to go back and start, I started watching Eccleston then. Um, and then watch the rest of Tenants run in time to watch it for Christmas for his regeneration. So university time was spent watching lots more Doctor Who than probably should have been. But yes, at that particular time anyway. Um, okay, so that's so that's when it all started. My love affair started there. Very interesting. That's neat. So you, you did not immediately know that you have that... Uh the shared gene that we all have <laughs> no no yeah. if, if someone had sold it to me as a kid I think if I if it had been around because I was born in 1990 so the show had just been cancelled mm. um I think it was literally like two months after I was born that they had officially announced that it had been axed so I didn't grow up with any of it and I had no family members who were interested enough to continue showing it to me. And I don't think it was very easily accessible for a while. I think I've got a few friends who watched it on there's like, uh, I think there's a channel called UK Gold, which um, shows a lot of comedy and old British TV shows. And I think lots of classic Who repeats were on there. Um, But that was something I wasn't aware of because my parents didn't like genre television. So it wouldn't have even been something that they would have gone hey you should watch this right which is right. which is ironic now because as a doctor who fan both my 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 mum when she was alive and my dad were both like oh yeah we watched it as kids and i was like oh i oh. didn't even know you liked it they were like oh it was on like it was something you'd all watch because the the nature of television in the 70s was very much like if it was popular you watched it and there wasn't a lot to choose from so i know my dad liked pertwee and I think my mum remembers Tom Baker because of their ages. Makes sense. Um, so, yeah. But I, until I started watching it, I had no idea they'd even seen it. That's how, like, out wow. of the loop I was. So, yeah. Wow. So, interesting. <laughs> Your story is a little bit similar to mine. I, uh, uh, I'm halfway to 60 years old so i i'm I'm a little bit older than you are and in the 70s um i had been a star trek fan and we used to have this paper magazine called tv guide and that was the only way that you could tell what was going to be coming up on broadcast tv and i remember uh watching star trek i'm talking the original series so many times that I had the dialogue memorized for almost every episode. So I had gotten burned out on it. And I remember looking up sci-fi and uh, over here, it was on PBS, uh, Mm. public broadcast channels. And I remember seeing something listed under sci-fi as Doctor Who on this uh, public broadcast TV station. And I remember watching the first episode. uh, It was the horror of Fang Rock. Uh, mm-hmm. with Tom Baker and Louise Jameson Good and I remember it being creepy scary and I couldn't understand anything and it was because of the accents you know I, I could not understand the British accents so that compounds things so if you think you were confused watching yeah. a David Tennant ep- episode and not quite getting the plot I was so confused that I also wanted to learn more mm-hmm. I wanted to know what was going on so uh, we have that in in common right there. Um, so um, let's let's touch on your big finished works here for a moment. Um, your first story was a subscriber's short trip titled "A Song for Running," and that came out in December of 2019, and it was read by none other than the now late Stephen Critchlow. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in September of 21. And he had been reading those subscriber short trips, almost every one of them for almost six years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm curious how that came to be with you. Um, certainly, it wasn't something where you just sat down and fired off an email to Big Finish and said, I want to be your next writer, and then just wait for a reply. Um, am I correct that it was it was something more complicated than that? You know, how did all that go down? It was a little bit more complicated. I, I was already starting to do my own original writing, so I haven't done much um, just because of time and how the Doctor Who stuff has taken off. But I was, at the time, writing little bits and pieces for anthologies, um, and 
I've done some original writing for a uh, anthology for all, all themed around the 50s. So I was doing like my own stuff anyway. And um, Big Finish was, uh, was uh, I want to say the summer or the spring that year. And it was my first time going to a, um, I think it was, no, it was my first time, or maybe it was my second time going to uh, a Doctor event overnight, kind of away from Bristol um, and not selling anything. It was just going as a punter. <clears throat> and I don't know if you know much about Big Finish Day. I'm sure you know a lot from different people, but it's just Big Finish convention so a bit like um li who or chicago tardis based in the states or here we have like you know lfcc or the, the small doctor who conventions this one was a big finish only convention and i was quite a big fan of big finish at this point i started getting into them over um the 50th anniversary was when i started listening to big finish um mm -hmm. and diving into the classic who stuff because it was so well merchandised to me to kind of like oh you haven't watched it you should watch it and it worked really well i have mm -hmm. to i have to give credit there to um the marketing team and moffa at the time were very good at going oh you want to know more about doctor who here's all its history we're celebrating its anniversary and big finish was part of that mm -hmm. and um yeah, I went to Big Finish Day. And at Big Finish Day, they do panels. So they do a writer's panel. They do a panel on talking to different actors regarding different series as they do, because obviously they don't just do Doctor Who, as you know. But right. one of the writer's panels included um, Alfie Shaw as producer. And I remember us being sat there going, I wonder how they get new writers, because obviously, as, as you know, even now, there's a plethora of writers that get included in Big Finish things. They're coming from theatre, they're coming from the fandom, like myself. They're coming from all sorts of places. But how do you know that that person is suitable to, to write? Because you can't just submit a script because that's that gets unsolicited material. You can't just send, here's my script about the Thai War. I want you to make it. That's right. what, how and that's, it works, right? That's that's for legal that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, somebody can't claim that, oh, that's my my story. Exactly. Right. So I, they, yeah, they, they, I, I've read yeah. about that. Yeah. Mm. And I am familiar with those, uh, the big finish day. And I'm so jealous. You people there in England have all the fun. And Don't worry, um, we will touch more on conventions. I know we've got, we've got a lot right, of stuff Right, right. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to go there. <laughs> but in the, in this circumstance, I was like, I wonder if, if this is a good moment to ask how they find new writers if they don't take unsolicited material. So I put my hand up for the panel and I asked the question and um, Alfie didn't answer my question. Uh, oh. He, I think basically he, he answered it, but he then misunderstood my question. I think I was a little bit nervous. Um, and I think he was also a bit nervous because it was his first time doing a convention. And he, I think he went on to explain um a different part of the process whatever it was it was very interesting I can't really remember the answer now but I knew it wasn't quite what I was asking and it wasn't until later I was minding my own business 45 minutes later and Alfie came running over to me and was like I realize I misunderstood your question entirely you asked oh. me a question and I and I was like oh that's okay what you said was interesting I'm afraid I do not remember what it was now but Alfie was like what was your question you were asking about finding new writers are you a writer then which led to a dialogue about me saying well i i would love to write for big finish i was just curious at the process i read i currently trying to write my own original work which showed alfie that it wasn't just doctor who i was interested in writing which meant that i was serious about the craft so he was like well um would you be interested because i run the short trips subscribe short trips um i'll send you an email get some stuff together and I'll um oh you send me an email um around February where we'll be looking for new writers and I think this is obviously uh trying to think of I can't remember the time scale I'm afraid but it wasn't long later I was thinking about emailing him after that interaction that he emailed me out of the blue and said oh, nice. we're looking for we're looking for writers obviously he remembered me from the event could you pitch something? And that's when I pitched a uh, song for running, um, which I still have a real soft spot for now. Um, for those who don't know the premise, it's about a little girl who um, is about to take what in England is still a kind of very, uh, 
controversial exam, which means that you, um, if you take it, um, the opportunities of you getting into a grammar school, which is a kind of much higher, like much higher academic uh, school that we have in this country, um, like regardless of your funding, you will still get a place at the grammar school if you pass this exam. Um, so it's a big deal and it's been around since the 50s. And the premise is this girl is running away from home because she's terrified of taking this exam, which is like 10, because you take it when you're 10 or 11, which I took the exam. It's not the best exam. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I thought it'd be really great to touch upon that and include an alien element and a bit of a fantasy element uh, with uh, the 12th Doctor. And so I, I pitched it. Alfie really liked it. So I had, I think it was six weeks once it had been outlined to write it. I wrote it, I send it off, and then we did we went did a few drafts, but nothing really big. And then I was told, oh, do you want to come uh listen to it being recorded? So oh, wow. which was a, which was lovely. Yeah. So I got to go wow. into um it wasn't um it's a big finish, have a variety of studios they use depending on the budget they have and how many people they need. And in this mm. case, it was literally just me, Stephen Critchlow. And oh, Alfie Shaw on a little serious? studio. Yeah. So Whoa. it was lovely. Yeah. It was really, really nice. Wow. It was a little, little place, um, little sound studio. And um, yeah, it was great. I mean, I, I still, I think what was really interesting is at the time, I mean, I was in a pretty low place when the recording was done because my mum had just passed away. So I was feeling a bit, um, I think it was like literally within a couple of days of her funeral that I had to go to the recordings. So everyone was being super lovely and super sweet. But it was really funny with Stephen Critchlow, who met me and he was like, I'm sorry, I was expecting a, a, a much older woman based upon the story you wrote because I'd set it in the 50s. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was very, it was really lovely. Absolutely. Both of them, absolute gentlemen. Alfie still get on with so well today. Um, and obviously Critchlow or Critch, he was like, call me Critch, call me Critch. Um, just listening wow. to him read the read the story and do his Capaldi impression. And it was just such a lovely experience. Um, that's and beautiful. Then I, yeah, that's, really lovely that is a, That is really a neat story. That's, you know, I loved it. I, uh, I felt it was a very sweet, emotional story. And you portrayed uh, Peter Capaldi's 12th Doctor absolutely perfectly. And um, I had no idea back when I listened to that story that I'd be talking to you someday. <laughs> that's that's one of the, that was around the time when I was starting to get so interested in Big Finish that I was actually starting to pay attention to who the authors were and who the musicians were mm -hmm. and uh, who the directors were. And um, that's that was my first encounter with your uh, you. You go by Theo, and Sophie Isles is your legal name that you use mm -hmm. for your professional work. Yeah, yeah. And yes, and that's the uh, that was my first encounter with Sophie Isles right there with mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Critchlow, who was one of my favorite readers. Wow, what a what an awesome story! Mm -hmm. I did not expect that. That that is absolutely beautiful. Um, if you think back to, I, you know, I was going to ask you if you think back to the first time that you heard the final version of your story, you actually got to see it being recorded. I did. So, I mean, it, it's very different. I think like, listening to it recorded was great because you're listening to the story and listening to them saying your name. But the actual final recording obviously has the Doctor Who music and the sound effects and the the added um, bits and pieces. So actually, whilst it was emotional to listen to it with with Stephen and Alfie, it was different because I was in work mode. You know, I was thinking to right. it, making sure that right. it sounded correct, but actually getting sent the the digital file of here it is. Uh -huh. It's out in the world now. How did that and feel? Oh, I, I cried. I, I was working oh, okay. at university at the time <laughs> and um, my um, I got the email through saying that it'd been released and it'd be in my Big Finish account, downloaded it straight away. <laughs> and I was just sat at my work desk sobbing as I heard the 12th Doctor's <laughs> theme with my name. And I was just like, oh, my God, that's so crazy. Wow. It was just like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, 
so and then obviously I he did so well with portraying the characters with the voices like I can't like Critchlow I'm afraid I don't know too many of his other works I know he's he did some voice acting for a game that my friend is really into and when he passed away there was like a whole thing I can't, I can't remember if it was Final Fantasy or not there was something that was like an online RPG that Stephen mm -hmm. Critchlow played an NPC for uh, like a non-playable character that you could interact with so when mm -hmm. he passed away there was like homages uh, for his character wow. and for Stephen all over this RPG space um, so yeah, he was so lovely, so, so lovely and so bright and energetic. Um, it is really sad that he's gone, but it's also so nice that we have his voice still to listen to. That's right. Um, you know, That's as, right. as, as a legacy, we still have it regardless of my work. His work is in, on lots of different short trips, subscriber short trips. He's right. done these voices and it's just so lovely that we get to listen to them again, even though right. he's not now, here. Now, I believe that people can still get those. And um, as I had mentioned earlier, I believe Stephen Critchlow did almost all of those for almost six years. Mm. And that was a strong motivation for me um, to remain a subscriber, even though I didn't have time to listen to the stories. I think there may have been a year or more that went by where the discs just stacked up and I just simply didn't have time to listen to them, but I loved his voice so much. Um, for people that uh, want to hear this story that we've just discussed, A Song for Running, what you'll need to do is go over to bigfinish.com and what you will want to do is order a bundle and make sure that it includes Blood on Santa's Claw and other stories. It was mm -hmm. released in a December, I believe, maybe November. It, it was released near the end of the year. And uh, order a bundle that has Blood on Santa's Claw and other stories, and you get a whole bunch of stories. There's a story anthology, and then you're also going to get Theo's story with that. And it's a good time to do that with it being right before Christmas. So go get that so go get that for yourself as a stocking stuffer uh you can stuff that in your own stocking and we won't tell anybody okay <laughs> so um as far i i guess it's a good assumption that before writing a uh 12th doctor story as portrayed by peter capaldi that you had to have watched every episode of his era by any chance he yeah. was my favorite doctor at the time. Um, I think he still is my favorite doctor for the for the new series in particular. I, it's not that I have a favorite necessarily, but I think Peter Capaldi's introduction as the doctor was when I fell fast and hard into the Doctor Who world. So I, I like at, I mentioned earlier about university. I was watching them casually by that point, mm -hmm. but I think it was when Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi were on and then Capaldi took over that I fell deeply in love with the show in all of its facets so I say from 2015 onwards I I was a, I was considered a super fan like the on radios they call me a super fan I'm like okay that's kind mm -hmm. of fair I guess after 2015 I was you know I you could ask me questions about Doctor Who monsters and episodes in a way that you couldn't ask a classic uh, like a casual fan who only just right. watch it every right. week and just enjoy it for for what it is where you know um I would say that yeah like because yeah because I and with Capaldi in particular I really loved the thick of it that he was in uh which uh is a political satire um show looking at UK politics which is really great to watch now because the UK politics as most people's politics I think in the world are a bit all over the place but it's very fun to watch politicians <laughs> being yelled at and he does it with with gusto uh, so <laughs> if I'm ever feeling particularly low or annoyed about anything I will put the thick of it on and watch Capaldi shout at a lot of people which so I knew I knew his work from the thick of it and uh to know that he was becoming doctor who i'm i'm a big fan of surly grumpy doctors so i quite <laughs> like colin baker for that reason i really love william hartnell for that reason mm. um so so capaldi's doctor really kind of appealed to me but i also liked that 
he could be soft and he could be sweet and he could mm -hmm. be kind, which is what I really wanted to play with with a song for running, which is in certain situations, the doctor's still the doctor. And I, I, I have a very strong feeling about the doctor always, even if they're in their worst place mentally, <laughs> will always <laughs> help someone else, you know? Um, um, so that's like, so Capaldi for me is just a, a grumpy, grumpy doctor who doesn't want to show anyone he actually cares. And that's how I write him. <laughs> so, okay. uh, yeah, so I think that's like, so whenever I've watched, so whenever I watch the Capaldi stuff, I always remember like, no matter how grumpy he is, it's because he cares about fixing the situation, making sure everyone gets out alive if he can you know, having to deal with the bigger picture of he might not be able to save everyone, which is why he looks so grumpy, which is why he wears that very hard face. But underneath right. it all is because he cares so much about fixing things. That's how I, I've interpreted his his era and his run. Um, and that's how I've I've attempted to write him. And I, I, I hope it went well. I think it did. Oh, you nailed um, it. You nailed oh, it. Here, you. can you tell me if I've got this correctly? Am I a good man, Clara? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Right. Um, the uh, the twelfth Doctor is what, right about the time when my wife and I started watching Doctor Who together, and I believe that uh, Peter Capaldi is is her Doctor, mm. um, and uh, I miss that era. That's mm. I, they, the, that era now seems a little bit classic on its own, even though it mm. really wasn't that long ago. So, had you read some of the Twelfth Doctor novels or listened to the uh, BBC New Adventures series audios with uh, the Twelfth Doctor? I I know that I did. I think I list. I definitely I listened. I definitely listened to some of the audios, BBC audios the names of which that have escaped me, but I remember reading Deep Breath, no, not Deep Breath, Deep Time, which yep. mm -hmm. is Trevor Baxendale, I think. I think you're I right. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, he he spends it in prison and he wears very weird pink fluffy socks from what I remember. And Clara's on the outside of prison trying to get him out. I thought it was a really fun yeah. concept. So I do That's remember That's a long that. story. Yeah, it's that's hardcore story. right there. Yeah, it's hardcore. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if there's anything else I remember. I mean, I did the Dwarf Doctor was so much my doctor. I did a lot of anthologies around Peter Capaldi, so I took part in Moon Man and um, a Dwarf Doctor anthology, um, just drawing bits and pieces for that. And I did my first ever Doctor Who charity thing I ever did, which I think only one person has ever read, um, was a story about Riggsy from, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, from Flatline, the um, the young lad, um, uh, Riggsy, who's also in Heaven Sent, no, not Heaven Sent, uh, Face the Raven with Clara, who okay. was like a kind of stand-in companion for a little bit. Um, and, um, the Twelfth Doctor calls him Pudding Brain, and he's a graffiti artist. Okay. And I really liked his character. Um, so I did, um, there was a, <clears throat> a charity piece a book that was released, which wanted to include every companion or anyone that was considered a companion um, from Big Finish to uh, current day. I think at the time it was finishing with Capaldi. And um, they were looking for short stories, looked like a page, maybe two, um, so I, um, got to the anthology late. I was like, um, basically a load of my friends were like, oh, if you want to write for it, you got to get onto it quick. Cause the, the slots are filling up. Cause even okay. though there are hundreds of companions, hundreds of people were like, oh, but I want to write Sarah Jane. Cause obviously everyone wants to write a story about Sarah Jane, right? You know, right, she's wouldn't? the most popular <laughs> one. So like yeah. everyone's like running to get all these slots. And I just, I had no internet and I was out and I knew I wouldn't get there in time. So I offered for like, well, let's do some ones that people aren't going to live a, give a lot of love to. So I think I volunteered Riggsy for Riggsy. Um, Riggsy. And they were like, oh, yeah, love to do that one. So, um, okay. yeah, the uh, doctor calls him Pudding Brain. So that's probably okay. why you don't remember his name. But he's well, there when Clara dies in Face the Raven. So okay. if you go back and watch that era, 
definitely ask your wife I, if she's a, her, if I remember, her doctor. Yeah. I remember the doctor calling somebody pudding brain. I do yeah, remember yeah. that. Now, um, do you recall the name of that uh, charity anthology? Off the top of my head, I can't, but let me just double okay. check some things. I think I know where I'll be able to find it if I have. Okay. Ooh. I'd like to know the name of that story. I want to read that because I, I, think, I think it's called Children in Time and it was done by Cosmic Press. Uh, mm -hmm. But this was in 2018. Really lovely little anthology. Um, I think you should be able to find it still. Okay. I think it, I think it was US in US based as well, so it might be even easier for you to find than for me. Okay. Um. So yeah. Okay. So um. I, I if I can't find it, I will see if I can find a link for you. Absolutely not a problem. I, but I'm, that, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna go check that out. Here, let me timestamp this to go back 12:38 a.m. Children in time. Okay, yeah, I want. I definitely want to read that. Yeah. Um, okay, so back during the uh, start of the COVID uh, lockdown pandemic mess, uh, that was a time when I myself got deeper off into Big Finish, as I had mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and I started to pay attention to the produ production credits uh, and uh, who who did everything: music, director, mm -hmm. uh, authors uh, in particular. And um, I took note of your name uh, with the uh, subscriber short trip. And then there was that same name again, Sophie Isles. I'm like, I, why is that familiar to me? And that would have been with the uh, Time Lord Victorious Master Thief, read by none other than John Colshaw. <laughs> and that came out in October of uh, 22. How did that go down? Gosh, that was, that all started with a text message. So I think it was. With a text. <laughs> with a te I know, tell me about it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Song for Running came out uh, December 19, I think you said. And I think it was mid-January, maybe early January the following year. So January 2020, um, when I got a message from Alfie. Um, because in having this rapport now with him at work was it was really quite like we, we exchanged text messages we wanted to make sure I was okay after my mum and he was so lovely but he sent me this text going how much do you like the master out of 10 and that was <laughs> literally the, the message I had and I was just like hmm. I so I applied with is this a trick question because <laughs> I had no and he was like no <laughs> um so I said well I love the master like uh, at the time obviously I I think Missy was the about to uh, no no um we had no master on screen because it was obviously uh when J Jody was on and there was no I think it was before Sasha had been announced so or just around the time that Sasha became the the, the master but no I was like I love the master I love that the, the master is such an interesting conniving character but i also love you can do so much with that you can either go down the dark and gritty road but you can also go down the quite pompous and quite arrogant maglomaniac villain like the mm -hmm. master can be all of those things um it just depends on yeah you can definitely go down yeah. all the roads so um anyway it's led to um um might be sending you an email i'll say okay <laughs> <laughs> don't know what that means and basically um there was a situation where um they really wanted to do something master related with time more victorious and they decided that they wanted two short trips and simon Gurrier, who i love a lovely man um um who i'd worked with at doctor who magazine um had written two outlines uh one um one which was set in like a kind of jungle and then there was one which was in in uh, relation to this kind of weapon that turned people into sludge. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, there's like, there's like these two outlines um, and they wanted to find someone else to write one of one of the outlines. So and um, I think Simon, I know, I think it was Alfie asked about me and then Simon said, well, I've already worked with Theo. So they were like, well, this makes perfect sense to bring. Theo on board we know they can write a short trip and this would be really a mm -hmm. uh, good exposure so yeah so I was brought on board for Time Lord Victorious for Master Thief um and yeah I got to choose 
the outline and the one that I liked the most was the weapon one. And I said, because uh, Simon was like, yeah, just pick whichever one you want. And I was like, okay, well, can I work with this one? And he, he was like, yeah, sure. Um, and then what happened after that was quite interesting because the original brief for Master Thief was it wasn't for um, Ainley or Delgado. It was for a different master entirely, but because of timing and budget, and I think it might be to do with studio, I think it was supposed to be for um, the McQueen master. So it was supposed to be for a different master entirely. Um, and which was fascinating to me that I, I didn't know very much about that master at all. Um, and I was going to have to do some research on it. And then last minute they were like, oh, no, we changed our mind. Um, could you do it for Ainley or Delgado? Because we're going to have John Coleshaw read them and he can do those impressions. Um, so I was like, oh, my God, I get to write for one of these. I love these masters. I know them much better. Um, Perfect. And um, Simon and I were like, well, which 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 master do you want? And he was like, which master do you want? And I was like, um, could I have Delgado, please? Because I like, I love Delgado. Right. Um, and he was like, of course, like, again, they'd work for both. But then with the outline that Simon had written, originally it began with the rampage that's in the story. Um, and I <laughs> went back to Alfie and Simon and was like, don't know if the rampage beginning for this particular outline works with Delgado. We know that he's a much different master to the others. Do you mind if I tweak this to work for his master? And they were like, nope, we trust you, go for it. And I was like, okay. Um, you know, this is only my second other thing I'd ever written for Big Finish. And also it was a bit more higher prestige. I was a bit concerned. But no, they were really keen on seeing what I'd bring. Um, and I kind of brought instead this kind of slow burn of this the master being a bit too arrogant for his own good and causing <laughs> his own chaos. Um right. I love so yeah, that. so so yeah, you know, I I I loved the idea of Delgado thinking he's going to walk into the situation with no problems, but actually causes his own problems right. because if he just did, if he wasn't so arrogant, he would have got away with everything in that story. But because he was like, oh, you know what, I will just uh you know, he's very so it worked really well for that, and um, yeah, submitted it. Um, got some edits back, did those edits, and then um, it just led to um, it being out in the world again. I didn't get to go to the recording for that one because obviously COVID has made that very difficult. <laughs> um, right. So unfortunately, right. I haven't gone to any recordings since Song for Running, but hopefully that will change one day. Um, yeah. But <laughs> but yeah, in terms of um, the recording for that, I had no idea what it sounded like. I hadn't I had only ever briefly heard the Delgado impression so I had no idea what was going to happen and then I heard the trailer I think they released mm -hmm. and my heart burst because it sounded so good um and then they all announced the story and yeah it was it was so good I was just overwhelmed at because the, the difference as well between writing a short trip and writing a subscriber short trip is they, they there's a little bit more money for short trips so short mm -hmm. trips there's a few more sound effects there's a lot more music cues and things like that where yep. subscribers kind of treated like a short story they might add some sound effects to right. um just because of budget so you know with song for running they included rain and they included like little little bits of music where if that had mm -hmm. been a full short trip there'd have been a proper music score there'd have been right. you know so right. because of the way budgets are um because obviously they they require different types of funding um so yeah so with uh, master thief um it was released with so Simon released his at the same it was all released at the same time in a bundle and it was the I think it was the first big finish like inclusion to the time of yeah Victoria I think it Stone. was yeah so that it, was a uh, that so was a was, big huge cross platform that included mm, every type of media I think it mm, was well all 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 forms of Doctor Who from mm, games uh television I mean mm, all inclusive now, were you aware of the fact that this was a large multi? Okay, see, so you, you yeah. did know. Okay, yeah, I did know. So when we were asked if we were in, wanted to be involved, so Simon obviously and Alfie were already involved, but I was kind of told like, here's like this, here's this project, here's what we're planning, here's 
the things you might need to know. Here's the things you probably don't need to know, but we're going to tell you anyway. So I, I learned, I saw, um, I saw the kind of notes on Brian the Ude, who became quite a big character right, in the time of Victoria right, Saga. Exactly. Not that he was ever involved in my story and I didn't need him, but I did right. get the notes. So it was really great. Okay. I think, I think I saw, I want to say I saw Russell's notes on the Ood, because obviously the Ood belonged to Russell T. Davis. This was long before Russell had come back on the scene for Doctor Who things. So it was like, really exciting to hear that I was looking at something that Russell had also been right. involved with, because I, right. I, you know, I love love his Doctor Who. So I was like, oh, cool. Um, uh, yeah, because I think they wanted to make sure that, because um, I know the eighth Doctor was involved, and they wanted to see if he knew what an Ood was, which they wouldn't know what an Ood was, but he would know what a centerite was. So there was like this whole wow. thing, like all these like comments, wow. because it's such an interesting and intricate process to make sure that we kind of following along with what's already been written by Big Finish, what's right. already known by Doctor Who fans, what's in, you know, the universe in general. So it is very much sometimes just a uh uh, <laughs> fact searching game of right, so has the master right. ever done this before oh no he hasn't or has the uh, you know i think i'm trying to remember if there was anything in particular for master thief i think the um the only thing i knew for sure that i had to mention in the master thief was that the gun had come from a, a certain place and it mm -hmm. then turned out that the weapon was something that was in the paul mcgann um story Right. So when I think it was when the Daleks and McGann met in one of the stories that was released afterwards, the master turns up and just condenses it into a weapon and then leaves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep. so, so you can listen to my story regardless of knowing those stories. Exactly. Which is can. why I think it worked really well. So that was good. The, uh, the whole time Lord victorious thing was one of the most incredible things that I have ever seen in Doctor Who and congratulations mm -hmm. to you for being involved in that that's Thank it's you. people are going to be looking back at that uh, generations ahead and looking back at that as a very uh, key achievement in the history of Doctor Who time Lord victorious I mean, it was, I don't know who came up with that idea. But it was absolutely genius to cross everything because it introduced people that may have only watched television episodes to audio dramas and introduced mm -hmm. people that may have only listened to audio dramas and or TV to comics. It introduced mm -hmm. all of the uh, yeah. forms of media that Doctor Who is available in in one big story, yet at the same time pieces of it could be standalone that's mm. it's unbelievable um and uh i i did love your your uh contribution to that and uh, if people want to listen to master thief you can go order that for download from big finish right now um now john coleshaw did an amazing job on that um then after that two months later in december of 2020 Big Finish released the third story of yours for them. Were you writing multiple stories at the same same time or something? <laughs> I I think, yeah. Well, I think I made so it was very interesting. My 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 stuff with Big Finish is is always very interesting because sometimes they'll be like, "Can we have this for like next month?" And other times it's, "Can we have this?" And we're not going to release it for a year. And you're like, oh, okay. So okay. I'm trying to remember. I think Master Thief was done very quickly, like in a very short space of time, which then got released in October. But then right. Benny, I think, happened around the same time, but then December. was released in the December. Okay. Um, but like a bit late. I think it was like uh, I think over the summer I wrote Benny. Okay. And then, so yeah, so so Benny came out quicker, but Master Thief came out first. <laughs> so it was all, it's okay. it's very strange with how things are released, but it all depends on the marketing for it, when it needs to come out. Like, because Benny was for Christmas, it was always going to be a Christmas exactly. thing. Right. So right. I think if I remember rightly, Benny was a was something I wrote either the spring or the summer of that year, with it come out in in Christmas. So yeah, so. Which is very great. I was like, that's so weird that it all came out like at once. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, folks, uh, what Theo is referencing here is the Frosted Deer, um, which was part of the Bernice Summerfield Christmas collection. And uh, you must be well versed on Bernice Summerfield. Uh, and that was actually the very first series produced by Big Finish uh, in 1998. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I I have to I have to tell a secret. I'm I don't know that much about Benny Summerfield apart from the little bits that I've heard. So I've I've heard a bit of her classic stuff, which I okay. thought was great. Um, and I have listened. I say classic stuff. So um, I I've listened to some of the I think Shadow of the Scourge she's in, and I think mm -hmm. I have listened to other Benny Summerfield audios that include her traveling with the Doctor or Ace. I've also listened to. Um, the special they released with Benny and River, which I think was the, um, ah, oh, is it the fourth of March, third of March? It's the 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 female only um, massive right. um, yep, thing I that remember they did. That one. Uh -huh. Was it fourteenth? Anyway, um, I can't remember which date it is, but yeah, the, no, the eleventh. I, 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 I think it was the fourth. I think it was the fourth of March. See, I, I know exactly. Important. I know dates, exactly. <laughs> talking about yeah i have that i'm so sorry it, it's I on my it bookshelf well. i can go and grab it real quick and check <laughs> no, we're was, good. or was we're it good. march 20th no i think it yeah. i think it was earlier in the in the month but it, yeah I, okay. it was, <laughs> <laughs> all right but no i i remember because i think it's they a great a that. great box set they previewed That's... that story at big finish day so you could listen to it in a dark cinema room which was amazing um and it was benny and river and the a uh, one who knows it benny and river um and it was just so oh was lila there no it's benny and river for that one um and i loved i love the character of benny i think she's amazing but i was very trepidatious about writing a story with her but i did know brax tell already because i know him from the gallifrey series which is one of my big big finish loves so i was like okay i could do this i could write it so i was like looking at the timeline going well i know brax and i know benny well enough let's do something mm -hmm. that i can do with these two characters um and it was uh, very much like a short trip a short story read by <laughs> uh, lee Sperman, who is amazing um right. And um, I mean, I've met her at a couple of entrances and she's so, so lovely. Um, so to be able to actually write something for her character was amazing. Cool. Um, and uh, I think the most interesting part for me was I really, because I, I, I have had a bit of a theme, which will continue being a theme because I just really enjoy writing children and writing teenagers, which seems to be mm -hmm. something that I keep doing. Um, and in this case, I really wanted to see what Benny would be like with children. So there's a whole segment where she's talking to like 10 year olds. And I was like, I want to make sure that I'm getting this right in regards to how Benny interacts with these characters, because as far as I'm aware, Benny hasn't spoken to many characters of this age group. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I uh, luckily I'm quite good friends with Gary Russell. So I was able to message him and was just like, look, I have a Benny Summerfield question i'm i'm writing something at the moment um who like are you a good person to ask and he was like oh no you should talk to jack rayner and i was like i should talk to jack rayner so i mean i already knew i knew i knew who jack was for context jack rayner is probably one of the best big finish writers and producers i think um amazing lady and helped create benny summerfield so um i was uh <laughs> with with gary's blessing i messaged jack like Hi Jack, I just wanted to double check with you um, where I was going with this with with this um, story for Benny, and just see what you thought about it. And she was like, "Well, first of all, it's so lovely that you've messaged me, but Benny is everyone's, and how you write Benny is always going to be correct." And I thought it was one of the best ways of making me feel comfortable with someone taking ownership with that character for a story. Okay. But she was also like. You know, um, she said, if I was writing it, I think what you're doing is correct. So I wouldn't worry nice. about it um, nice. just because um, I know Benny is good with she's good with teenagers because uh, there's a whole thing. I think I did a load of research on Benny, whether I'd listened to a lot of it or not. And mm -hmm. I think she's very good with teenagers because they're old enough to talk back to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, with children who were weren't quite teenage i think it was like preteens, so they were like 10 um in the story 
I wanted to see how she'd be with them, if she'd be standoffish or not. And I think mm-hmm. she'd be more cautious. And that's how I played it with these with these children. Um, and yeah, as far as I know, it went okay. No one, no one came out telling me that I was writing Benny wrong, I think. So um, yeah, it was it was a sweet little Christmas story. I didn't want to go crazy. I loved writing Brax and Benny um, interacting. And I basically stole the scene from um, in Jenna Jones and the Last Crusade, which oh, is a theme. I knew it. I, knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely knew it. There we go. Verified. <laughs> yeah, verified. Um, the beginning of Frosted Deer begins with Benny and Brax tied up in a cupboard. And then they end up on basically sci-fi motorbikes so you know i'm if if people are indiana jones fans i just need to put in loads more references but yeah it's (laughs) well you know what you did you know what you did you got me addicted to to bernie summerfield because i had never heard it i think once i uh realized uh what big finish was i don't even remember what year that was it may have been like 2006 or something like that i then went and looked back at i was looking for their oldest doctor who story and then found out oh well they didn't actually start with doctor who what is this thing bernice summerfield Mm -hmm. and um after i heard your story here uh the frosted deer then i actually started going and ordering uh more of of the bernice summerfield stories and i haven't heard a whole lot of them So, so uh, you got me very interested in, in her, and I absolutely loved that story. You know what? That makes me want to go listen to it again. You know, people should probably go pick that up. That's that's a really good anthology. And here we are right before Christmas again. So uh, there you go, folks. There's another stocking stuffer. And you can also <laughs> stuff, stuff that one in your own stocking, and we won't tell anybody, okay? All right. So... Um, <laughs> Then just a couple of months ago, uh, this last summer, saw the release of yet another big finished story by you. Um, the first days of Phaedon, is that it? Uh, Phaedon? Fiden. 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 Okay. Yes. The first days of Fiden, and that is part of Gallifrey War Room Allegiance. I mean, my goodness, you are all over the place. And this story right here, this has almost a dozen characters in it. And and including, it's full cast. I mean, we're moving on here. I'm starting to see a pattern. Okay, see, subscriber short trip, short trip, and then wham, ah, full cast, a dozen people. And it's led by mm-hmm. Louise Jameson as Leela. Mm-hmm. And um, my brain simply does not, cannot, and will not understand how a human brain can achieve something like that. Do you have to compartmentalize each one of these characters? Is one of the characters you, perhaps? <laughs> Are you in your own story? I mean, I I don't understand. Did... I, I, I don't get it, how somebody can write something that complex. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I I am no master of it. I, I will co- confess uh, script writing is new on me also. Um, so this was, as you rightly said, my first script, uh, full full cast script. So basically um, <clears throat> within Fiden, there are two, no, I think there's four, five main characters. One of those is Leela. Um, one of those is Narvin, who is a regular Gallifrey <clears throat> uh, original character. And then we also have uh, the General, who makes his appearance in the Capaldi era, um, played by the wonderful Ken Bones. Uh, absolutely amazing. Let me just clear my throat, because I don't know what's going on okay. in my throat, David. It's been very choky. Yeah, I'm take a break there. I'm going to get some water here. <clears throat> But um, no, so you've got Ken Bones, Leela, the general, and then my two original characters for like two two new cast members, um, and <laughs> it writing a script is kind of like you know when you're a ch- when you're a kid and you play with figurines and you're mm-hmm. kind of like 
oh hello i'm going to the shop today and then you get up another figurine and you go oh i want to go to the shop as well basically mm-hmm. script is just doing that but in your head and then you're just writing really? down it's it's very really? it's it's very much like playing pretend in your head so wow with most writing it feels like that because with writing you are kind of making stuff up and you're inspired by things that happen mm-hmm. or things that you love but with with script writing in particular it is like trying to play a movie in your head and then writing that down um just because <clears throat> um even though again it's different with audio than it is to film um because of audio you can only um <clears throat> you can only use what everyone's going to hear which is why big finish is so fascinating to me because you can create such fantastic worlds and settings with just audio yeah you don't have to worry about a budget you don't have to worry about plastic sets or it not looking correct you can then you can do things that could not be done on tv exactly so yeah it's it's awesome i mean um but in terms of script writing in general it's a very difficult process I mean, at first I was overwhelmed by the format. I think I spent a long time staring at, at my computer like, oh no. <laughs> um, but I ended up kind of doing a lot of it on um, on paper. So I would then okay. just do all the dialogue on paper and then I would then start inputting it onto the computer in the correct format because it's very, you know, you have to consider sound effects, you have to consider music cues, you have to consider right. how long each scene is, you have to consider how long people are talking for, because we're in an interview situation, so we're expected to talk in a different way than we would talk casually if we met out and about. So it would be a, perhaps more fluid, there wouldn't be so many questions, it'd just be like, hi, how are you? Yes, I'm fine, how are you doing? Yeah, right. I had a difficult day at work, that sort of thing. So you have to try and make the script feel like it isn't scripted. So right. there's a lot right. of work involved there as well about trying to make it feel that this is actually happening and you're not like saying just just saying things for the sake of them being needed for the story. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it's difficult. I'm not going to lie. I loved it. I loved every second of it. And once I got my head into the process, but it okay. wasn't like it wasn't as simple as. I know what I'm doing and I think right. a lot of writers will say the same right. because it's a different format um you especially if you're jumping from one to another if you're used to writing prose and you're writing sentences and settings and all that stuff and suddenly you can only write dialogue almost it's a very okay. massive juxtaposition okay um you know that's uh you touched on what I was going to ask you uh next um, I was going to ask uh, what a typical writing process is for you, um, mm. such as do you sit down at a typewriter with a blank piece of paper and then just type uh, the story title by Sophie Isles, <laughs> or or is it more complex than that? And and mm. I guess you do use paper, then you move to, to the computer, and mm. that is a very interesting, interesting description there. Mm. I, uh, for us my uh younger brother and i was star wars guys Mm. you know uh and matter of fact uh george lucas from what i understand uh used to 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 play with uh i guess he used to make his own characters or figurines Mm. and that that's very interesting uh i have never heard an author uh describe it that way before that's i mean yeah, which I, I haven't it... talked to tons of authors. I've I've interviewed a few of them uh, at this point, but that's I I can easily understand what you mean by that. Um, yeah, I, I guess obviously I don't literally sit down with figurines, but I guess it does make like as as yeah, an analogy, exactly. What you're doing is you're playing in your head. In your head, yes. And then you're trying to make sure that that play makes sense on paper. Right. If that makes okay. sense. I, yeah, I, I don't know if that helps. Um, it it yeah. does. That's that's a really interesting way of, of looking at it. So um, th- thank you for going into detail like that. Uh, somebody out there somewhere is going to watch this in the future and they're going to pick up on that and go ding. <laughs> so, um, all right. Are you currently writing more stories for Big Finish or would that be under wraps if you were? Unfortunately, what I am doing is under wraps at the moment. Okay, gotcha. All right, so. cool. So we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> um, so how, how does it feel to have your name down in Doctor Who history forever? 
very weird <laughs> very very weird <laughs> to know that to know how i have uh, had any thing to do with it at all is kind of terrifying um because you know <clears throat> it's it's such a massive fandom and a massive show and a massive part of particularly I, I don't know I know in the US it's not so revered like Star Trek I imagine is quite revered in terms of the US history I guess as a TV right. show right. I feel like Britain like and the UK hold that with Doctor Who I mean even yeah. like the, the blue think... if you see if you see a police box here mm-hmm. even if you don't watch the show you know it's from Doctor Who if you right. see a Dalek here Everyone goes, oh, that's from Doctor Who. You right. don't have to have watched it. You just know what it is. It is part of the, right. the the culture now. It's a bit like knowing Sherlock Holmes without ever ever reading a Sherlock Holmes. People right. know who Sherlock Holmes is. Um, it's it's part of the culture that is the UK. Um, so it's it's so weird to think I have had any part in that at all. Um, yeah, even the I small parts. Um, so yeah, it's 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 amazing and terrifying and all those all those things <laughs> yeah because you're not just uh a part of doctor who history you're a part of british cultural history yeah wow. just very strange <laughs> wow wow okay so um certainly uh being a writer is not something that would be a hundred percent successful all of the time with like a Midas touch because that would be like a fairy tale um so have you ever dealt with rejection uh where your work was just not accepted or even ignored and if you have how did you deal with it i mean rejection is part of all of all of writers lives i mean i i think um I, I don't know a writer who has sat there and said everything they've given in has been 100% approved, 100% mm-hmm. gone through. Um, I mean, for Big Finish in particular, um, just, just as an example, before I even started writing for them, I would enter the subscriber, uh, not, uh, sorry, not subscriber, the short trip um, competitions. Mm-hmm. And um, for those who don't know, Paul Sprague uh was um a big finnish employee who passed away um i think i want to say 2016 i'm not entirely sure but um i remember i remember reading about that yeah so in his memory they do a competition every year so that anyone can submit a script um as a short trip um there's like you have to write a 600 word outline you have to write the first page and it has oh, to be yeah, the yeah. you know <clears throat> and isn't you know, that hundreds of people it, submit right isn't that going on right now um, or did it so just end? i think i think we it's just ended so we're just waiting on okay. usually they release it at christmas um okay so yeah you get um uh so it's it's a mammoth job i think big finish um have to go through thousands of uh thousands of people coming in um wow. submitting their ideas um and obviously like there's like <clears throat> because of copyright and stuff like that like no dialects are allowed you can't use the war doctor you can't do this you can't like so like there's lots of stipulations about what you can't do right and even then people just want to send in their door story about dialects <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> Well, you know, that it, that it, probably would yeah. eliminate about half of them right there, right? Yeah, <laughs> right yeah. Off the bat. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, certainly some people who just don't follow the the guidelines don't get through. But then there are people who do, and there there's there's still right. hundreds. And I think from memory, I submitted three times, and each time I was I didn't get anywhere, like nowhere at all. So the first my okay. first story was a first Doctor story um i cannot remember much about it i think i think they ended up on a prison planet and it was very odd but i submitted the story and i didn't get anything back and then the second time i submitted a seventh doctor story with ace and the seventh doctor and i got mm-hmm. nothing back and then the third okay. time <clears throat> i submitted a 12th doctor story um and that story was about a, a young girl who uh was hiding in a cinema uh during the 50s because i was doing a lot of research in the 50s at the time for the book i was i was being involved in so i'll I'll use the research to my advantage so i wrote this story about this young girl called i think her name was 
Catherine. I think I named her after my grand, so I think her name was Catherine. And um, she ended up running into to the 12th Doctor. And basically there was a whole thing where for some reason the, t- the cinema in the future and the past was connected and they were having a chat. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so I submitted that story and I got a rejection email. Oh, which okay. I heard nothing for the last two, but this one I got so the a rejection. Third time was a charm. At least you got a response. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got a response. I was like, "Oh, that's right. good." But the response was probably one of the most touching emails I'd ever had. Um, so um, it was the year before my mum passed away. So I know it was. Uh, I was about a girl grieving the death of her mum, and in the you know intriguingly considering that would be a year later that actually would happen to me but what was interesting was um the rejection letter was like I really felt this and I thought it was really good unfortunately we're not taking it through but I want you to keep writing and it was um the lovely girl um Ian Atkins who used to run the short trips um Mm -hmm. and then Alfie took over um and it was just the most lovely email really lovely email and um yeah if it wasn't for that email I probably wouldn't have kept trying so you know I know not you know people get bad rejection letters all the time and I know that sometimes the ideas you want to put forward aren't really what people are looking for or you know there there have been things I've pitched to Big Finish in in response to things where they've gone oh this is good and then they've gone, actually, this isn't working anymore because we've changed this episode or we've done this or we've done okay. that. And then, okay. you know, because and so your ideas get bounced often. And I think right. it's just something as part of the nature of your work that you right. ha- it's like a collaborative process. But in this process, particularly as a writer, there's actually a lot less um, solitary work in that way, um, particularly okay. with Big Finish, where you're just like, I'm going to ping you an idea and they'll go we don't like that or we like this could you elaborate and then you might elaborate and they might say well we like all of this but we don't like the ending and then you're going to go away and you've got to think about what the new ending will be so there's right there's back and forth i think particularly with writing for an ip like the doctor who and that would be with anyone for star wars for star trek if anyone is writing for something that already has a boss at the top if you're writing for yourself and then it gets rejected that's fine because you just then send it to someone else because someone will always like what you do someone will there will be always someone out there that likes what you do and I think that's something that I think is really important to remember so you know um you know if you do get pushed back there will always be someone who likes it there will always be an audience for it somewhere and just to keep trying and keep putting it out Um, And that's kind of my idea of how rejection works. Um, And also those stories and ideas are never wasted because it might work for somebody else. So, for example, you know, there might be, I I mean, I've I've submitted things to anthologies that are separate to Doctor Who entirely and they've not got in. I've gone, actually, if I rework that idea and I put a Doctor in there, that's a Doctor Who story. So... You know that there's this is how it's quite a creative process but i rejection is hard rejection isn't very nice we all get rejected it's just part of our job but it's it's what you do when you get rejected is the important bit if you say well i'm rubbish as much as you might want to feel it at the time it's don't sit on that just kind of take a deep breath try and think about it in a different way and then move on um and see what else you can do with the idea so i think that's really important okay that's very interesting and that is very well put and i'm seeing two patterns here um you uh have a key to success that is shared with the other authors that i have interviewed and then the other pattern is that the song for running was set in the 1950s your first uh subscriber short trip Mm -hmm. and then your 12th doctor story that was rejected as the third time submitting to the Paul Sprague Memorial Contest mm-hmm. that actually earned a proper rejection letter 
that inspired you was also set in the 1950s. So a mm. couple, couple patterns I'm noticing there. So well, um, I was doing a lot of research for the 50s at the time. So it just made sense. To, like sometimes, you know, the, the, the saying of write what you know, that's not necessarily, I think, the exact thought behind it is like if you if you know a lot about um art let's say it would be silly not to use that advantage if you're right. writing something and you you're like well I can write about an artist I know what their daily life looks like mm. I know <clears throat> you know something like that so for example I I know a lot of animators so if I really wanted to I could sit here and I could write a whole story about an animation studio because I know enough animators to know their job to make it feel authentic. I may not have worked in an animation studio longer than a couple of months, but I would know, you know, it's writing what you know, not necessarily, you know, if, I don't know if that makes sense, but that kind of sense of, yeah. you know, um, and at that time I was doing a lot of research on the fifties because I was taking part in an anthology for the 1950s, which which is out if people are interested in that. Um, what is that called? So it's called uh, Sock Hops and Seances. And it was uh -huh. made by an uh, indie, indie, indie publication company called 18th Fall, who are lovely, really lovely mm -hmm. company. And yeah, and they do anthology series. And um, yeah, the 50s one I was involved in and was probably is my only piece of original writing, I think, that exists that isn't Doctor Who related out in the world. Okay. So, okay. yeah, I am I familiar with it. Though. Yeah, I am familiar with it. And um, for the people that watch this on YouTube, there's going to be a link to Sock Hops down underneath this. And also in the uh, closing <clears throat> uh, photographic musical tribute slideshow to Fio at the end of this uh, interview, it, there's going to be a picture of the cover of that as well. So um, <clears throat> have you, <clears throat> excuse me here, let me, let me get a little sip of water. Okay, have you ever considered writing Doctor Who stories uh, for the BBC Doctor Who audio originals series, or would you if you were asked? So are you referring to um, like doing anything original for the BBC, or do you well, mean actually writing for the series Doctor Who itself? That's the next question. The TV series, okay, <laughs> okay. So, um, they uh, BBC has uh, a series out which is called the uh, the BB. It's it's a very generic name, so it can mm. be confusing. It's actually called the BBC Doctor Who Audio Originals. Mm. Andrew Lane, Andy Lane, that I interviewed a couple of months ago. Uh, is one of the authors he's had two stories released in the series and he has a third one coming out in october of 23 and then will hadcroft uh just released his first uh story the resurrection plant uh and a couple of months ago it, he spent several decades writing that and these are dramatized readings uh produced and released by BBC with no ties oh, cool. to Big Finish. So oh, wow. um, I guess you haven't considered writing for those? Um, well, I've heard of them. Um, okay. I, I have definitely heard of them, but um, I would love to write for the BBC, but it's 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 more of a sense of um, if they'd want me, I suppose. I would have to right. see if I could... I, I would have to see if... Um, I think of how to explain this I guess with with that sort of situation it would be um usually I'm approached um so that's what I've I heard. guess if I knew yeah. if I knew who was in charge I would express my interest and if they were interested in taking me on I would then pitch I suppose that would right. be how that would work but yeah I of course yeah it'd be lovely to write more or always keen to write more stuff so it's not a sense of not wanting to is like okay. what would what would that process be <laughs> like who, you know john who, ainsworth i do know john ainsworth is okay. he the one who's running it <laughs> i think so i i i you know what i'm gonna have to go back and either ask will hadcroft or or look at the the interview i think john ainsworth anyway okay yeah. so <laughs> you <laughs> I got my fingers crossed for you. I want to see, <laughs> I want to hear more of your story, your Doctor Who stories. Um, yeah, you obviously would write for the television series. 
I think I would. I think I would be terrified. And I think the <laughs> the difference would be, I think because it's a different format again. So we already discussed like the difference between a, a script and a piece of prose. So like short trip is just a, the doctor said this and the companion said that. The script is obviously, you know, that kind of make believe in your head with all the different characters. It's the same again but you're having to consider the visual medium. You have to consider the budget. You have to consider how yeah. these things are portrayed, you know? Um, and I think because like we said with audio, you can do anything with audio if you can convince the audience with the audio that, you know, the sky is green and there's red grass, you know, you just have to explain that. <laughs> Right, Where, right. You know, right. you know, when it comes to visual content, you have to make sure that what you're able to, what you're selling is something that you feel is feasible um or so, or like creatively find ways to make it work in the budget i think okay. there's a lot when it comes to visual storytelling the film and tv it there's a lot more i think that you have to consider as a writer that you don't with the other mediums <laughs> because you have so you to consider you already know you already know okay you know what uh, i'm seeing a pattern here okay Subscriber short trip, <laughs> short trips, Benny anthology, full cast audio drama, maybe BBC audio originals for BBC, and then wham, BBC television. I want to see it in the credits written by Sophie Isles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I oh. if that's something you want to do, I, I hope I hope that you go for it. Uh, I. Back. I have no doubt that, that you could. So um, going back to your childhood, uh, your formative years, perhaps in school, do you ever recall having a mentor tell you uh, that you were talented or even genius? <laughs> no. no. I, I, okay. I've, I've been, I have been told the opposite. I had oh. a, <laughs> yeah, I, I had, at one point I had a teacher who um, said, Oh, there's no way you can do that. That was fun. Um, oh, and that was, that was in, <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, Great teacher I, I, there. I, yeah, I, okay. I, I, I. That's not a mentor. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I, I think that there's. How do I put this? I've had quite a few unfortunate experiences with role models who have told me maybe maybe you shouldn't consider that. Hmm. You should do something else, and that has actually made things worse. So, I, I mean, role models I've had, I mean, I've, I've had some wonderful role models of friends and family who have, you know, instilled a creativeness in me, but I would never actually say that any of them have called me a genius on okay. the contrary. I think they, they, they think I'm a little bit weird and a little bit insane. Um, <laughs> I think that's, that's more the, uh, the vibe <laughs> I portray. Welcome to um, the club. I've been called weird before too. <laughs> so um i'm going to ask you a really broad open-ended question here this is the only question like this in the interview um mm. could you tell us a bit more about who you are where you're from and what motivates and drives you gosh um yeah <laughs> there's well, there's an open-ended question <laughs> open-ended and you don't have to go into great detail just you know something something about you that people probably don't know in the doctor who world uh oh, gosh. do you have any hobbies hobbies <laughs> i mean <laughs> uh i i like to play dungeons and dragons in my spare time um okay so i'm a big big dungeons and dragons fan and cool. i play rpgs um i like video games i have a cat called ollie who would normally be sat behind me on my bed but he has escaped um, okay and i i currently um work for a medical journal um when i'm not writing doctor who things um so i work for a company in london uh assisting authors and publishers um of of journals to um get medical stuff out there which i think is really important especially in the climate that we're in where there's still issues with covid and right i just heard about us. two more variants yeah so yeah you know i think it's okay. really important that that information still out there so it's really it's a really good job to have um and i think who am i i mean 
I'm still figuring that out. And I think that's okay. something really important to to share, to be honest. I mean, as you know, as I think a lot of people all already know from my social media, I'm currently in a place where my life is changing quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm changing my name and um my my gender, I I I consider to be non-binary. And um, just trying to, and I mean, uh, you know, I'm now with my girlfriend, right. uh, Georgia, um, mm-hmm. which is again uh, very new for me. So there's a lot that's happened this year that has made me assess that. And I think I'm just trying to be myself all the time, which is something I think for a long time I didn't allow myself to be. I thought right. I had to be one way and now I'm trying to lean into what makes me happy nice. and that comes so I think that's where I am with me nice well congratulations because so, yeah. you only live once and yeah, yeah. 30 32 you're still a kid that's really young <laughs> you, you've <laughs> got you. a lot of years ahead to 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 advance <laughs> so um am I correct that you uh have made some contributions to Doctor Who magazine I have. I think I've written in total seven or eight articles. Uh, a couple of them were reviews. One of them I I actually wrote about the the charity stuff that I did. Another one was an article about the Aztecs. There, there, I did like lots of little little articles. One of them I wrote with Simon Guria, which is how um, uh, we ended up working on Master Thief together um oh but really? yeah I yeah okay. I um so basically um Doctor Who magazine um allowed Simon to mentor me in the Doctor Who magazine stuff so that was quite nice um okay. and yeah uh the Aztecs wasn't that isn't that a That's... missing no oh, no 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 yeah. no that was the savages okay the yes. savages is missing okay not the aztecs yeah, okay. yeah the aztecs well, is it's, the, the forgive wonderful me, barbara it's, story. forgive me it's like 1 30 in the morning here i'm, I'm <laughs> no, that's about to okay. start getting groggy aztecs uh savages <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think they're one in the same <laughs> so okay um wow that's a good number of contributions to doctor who magazine mm. uh that that is that is really cool so um You've been a regular with the uh, DWAS, the, uh, for people to, that don't know, that stands for the Doctor Who Appreciation Society, um, and they have fanzines, uh, Cosmic Masked, uh, Cosmic Mask, and uh, the Celestial Toy Room. Um, and have you written short stories for them or no. what were your contributions? So, uh, my, my contributions for those were purely art based. So, um, which has been quite nice. Okay. Uh, so basically, um, occasionally anything that I've drawn, um, I, I get a message from the lovely guys at Dwas as it's sometimes known Dwas. as so W okay. Dwas. Um, and they're like, do you mind if we, we use your artwork for our fanzine? And I'm like, yeah, of course, like it, it's there, there for the taking. Don't worry. Um, and it gets put on the back of the magazine or sometimes on the front of the magazine. Uh, just depends on what the the overall theme is for that month. Um, and it's, it, I think it's happened maybe f- again, probably about six, seven times. Um, wow. But yeah, okay. so it's very sweet. Um, and they're, they're always they always ask, which I think is great. <laughs> so because cool. sometimes people don't don't ask and put things up you know what um people can be like with with internet things but no they're, oh, they're yeah. all, they always message and go w- w- is that okay you know go i'll send you a high-res version and do i put a lot of my fan art up online um so yeah so it's all good um but no okay. I, I love supporting to us and i love that they do a convention called the capital which is based in gatwick um which is not far from uh Heathrow so it's it's, okay. it's another airport but it's a place called Gatwick um near London and um yeah it's, it's a really nice little event really good and they get some really interesting people I think that was how I met uh I think they had um people from Doctor Who and the Daleks I think they had reverse Toby who played Susan for the movie mm-hmm. 60s movie um, wow. And I'm sure, I'm sure they had some more people, but my brain 
is also leaking out of my ears. But no, they they do they have some <laughs> wonderful, wonder, wonderful, wonderful people at the Capitol. But then most conventions I go to, um, they're always so lovely and always bring such an array of guests. So yeah, highly recommend anyway. That's awesome. That's awesome. We're we're getting near the end here. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the conventions here in just a second. Mm. But you just reminded me of something. The di- uh the distance between Heathrow and Gatwick, uh but with you being in Bristol and then doing some work in uh London, isn't it two hours between Bristol and London? It is, yeah. So it's do you two, use, it's a two hour train drive? journey? Do I you can drive. drive. You, oh, you tra- I, uh, you use a train? I, yeah i tend to use the train just because um okay. when i stay in london it's not easy to park so okay I'd have to, sounds I'd like have san to francisco pay for parking. Mm. i'd have to pay for parking and it kind of makes more sense to just get the train because that even though that cost is still quite a bit i don't have to worry about parking my car so it i makes kind sense. of yeah I, I get the best best of both worlds i can still travel it cost about i think it will cost less and then i can't park right outside and it's just a bit of, i think as the british would call it a bit of a faff it's just a bit of a, a bit of a pain so yeah. it's like let's just take just take the train <laughs> right there you um, go yeah. yeah the the lot of people uh may not realize how serious it is um uh, with parking that you and i we're not joking about parking i think san francisco's got twice as many cars as what there are legal parking spaces it can be pretty stressful actually Mm. um so when you're spending that much time commuting on the train do you ever do work with your writing or art during commute yeah i've 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 I've, okay i've got an ipad that i use for drawing um so drawing is easier to focus on on a train i think than writing but then i might make notes um in a notebook um um, if I'm or like while I'm listening to music, I'm like, oh, I've I've had a thought, and I'll just put it in a notebook or something. Okay. Um, but yeah, okay. it it depends on what I'm working on, and yeah, it just depends really. Okay, gotcha. But, I know there's a there's a beautiful uh, picture of you on the train that you put online recently. Uh, I think you put that on Twitter like a couple weeks ago or or something. Um, okay, the uh, let's see here. So, you know, to me here in the States, they, there are several conventions per year. Uh, there's there's a big one in Chicago, which I went to once. Uh, there's a big one in L.A. I don't remember the name of it, but it's like a 10-hour drive from here. And we don't have very many conventions. And when we do, they're these big, massive, expensive things. And... I would rather just enjoy Doctor Who from the comfort of my own home mm-hmm. <laughs> and spend that money on other things than than going to a convention because they're just they're, they're outrageously expensive. But when us uh, here in the states look at uh, you guys over there, it seems like uh, a fairy tale land where there's like a Doctor Who convention of some sort, like every weekend, and it seems like you're at all of them. <laughs> are you are you going to a doctor who convention every weekend <laughs> no not every weekend i think um it, it's interesting before the pandemic i could have told you that i could have been at one almost every weekend and it wasn't actually <laughs> um it was because i was selling my artwork there um so i would um talk to the organizers and ask about selling work so then i would it would be a work thing um but since the pandemic i haven't been to so many um but there are there are such a variety you've got the phantom boys um who run uh one, two, i think they run like four i think they, I think they run three big events uh, a year and then they do little signings in london every month so it does feel like they take over a hell of a lot of the calendar then you've got mm-hmm. hooverville which is based up i've heard in, of that you know, Derby, which is where Big Finish is also the Big Finish Day is also held in Derby. Right. Um, and then you have our bigger events. So, like I would say, uh, oh, there's also sorry, there's there's Bedford Who Charity Con, which just do stuff for charity. So that's really nice because what you put in actually goes to food banks and local support in Bedford. Um, there's Stars in Time, which is not a Doctor Who event, but is like a smaller convention that's based here in the Southwest. Um, mm-hmm. There's lots and lots of little events. And I think, like I said, with, with Doctor Who being such a cultural phenomenon, um, you know, most Doctor Who, uh, most events that hold any sort of convention based thing will have a Doctor Who actor there. 
um, no matter how how long they were in the show for. Um, you also get the massive events. So I know like there's New York Comic Con and stuff like that in the States. We have London Film and Film and Comic Con here, right. which is a massive deal. Um, and they See, do. You're, you're proving my point. Here. You're yeah, proving my lots. point here. <laughs> there are lots. I think <laughs> I think I didn't used to go to them at all. The first Doctor Who event I ever went to was, funnily enough, L.I. Who in Long Island. Um, so that was in 2017. I decided, no, no, sorry, I tell a lie. The doctor, first Doctor Who I went to, Who event I went to, was for the end of Series 9, which was, I think, 2017. And that was my first time running into anything Big Finish related um, in, in, in real life. Um, there was a stall at this massive uh, convention center with Big Finish things on it. And it was my first time buying a physical purchase of Big Finish, which was amazing. Um, and I, you know, meeting people on the stall. Um, but yeah, my, my first like, big convention that wasn't... Um, run by the BBC because that one was run by the BBC was Long Island who I flew from <laughs> from Wales at the time no Wales to London and then London to Long Island so I, I got up Long New Island York. New York yeah yeah and then I yeah. did a convention in a hotel for three days yeah. and then I came yeah. home um they are expensive I I they are very expensive and I feel like it really depends on what you want to get out of the convention itself. I know people who go just just for the the joy of being there, um, just to be around different fans and meeting fans. Um, some people like to go because they like to get the autographs and the signatures and everything else. Exactly. Yeah. And they can they yeah. can that can that can total up. I mean, I think just this weekend gone, they had the London Film of Comic Con Winter, which had Jodie Whittaker, David Tennant matt yeah. smith yeah. um and i think you could get a photos with like duos of those and you're looking at oh over that's right in fact 300 pounds um just oh, it, for yeah seriously of, yeah yeah lot, which i would never wow. be able to afford um wow so, no you know, i wouldn't do so it I, I wouldn't do it either that I, I, you know i would pay the entry fee to be like i was there and i got to hang yeah. out with some friends but i would i don't think i could feasibly afford i would do one perhaps and i would save that yeah. money up uh, or I would ask for it for a present or something the once, but to do well, all three in one day. Uh, nah. is, mm, you know, I've seen, I was, I was reading about that event and I've seen a bunch of those photos here in just the last couple of days. The, the ones with the blue background, it kind of mm. looks like a blue cloudy background. I had no idea those were that expensive. You know, William Shatner was uh, at the university uh, down the street here recently. Uh, and uh, I think it was, I think it was two hundred dollars to mm. get your picture with William Shatner. I yeah. declined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't have my picture with William Shatner, and that is perfect. That is perfectly fine with me because I still have the two hundred dollars. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, um, the uh, yeah, it's just it, it it's so how many times have you been to the U.S.? I visited the U.S. three times now. So okay. I went to, um, I went to Long Island to. And then I've done the Gallifrey event in LA twice. Um, okay, Gallifrey, um, that's what it's called, yeah. yeah. So, but I think it's slightly different. For, I don't know how you feel about it, but for me to travel to America for an event feels more like a holiday. So I'm doing okay. Doctor Who things and having a holiday. So I'm right. doing three days in the convention, but then I'm also visiting Universal. I'm also visiting Disney. Right. So it feels right. like a bigger holiday where I guess if you're, already living in the US and you want to go to a Doctor Who convention, it costs you so much to get there and then you, you might gas, not want to do yeah. all those things and stuff and then go home. Um, yeah. So people only do the event where the, the the luxury is us going to the US. Like I've got quite a few friends who do the Gallifrey uh, like um, uh, pilgrimage every year um, okay. and they're based here and all my British friends end up at Gallifrey every year they do LA and they do like two weeks and they also get to do the Doctor Who thing and meet up with their American friends and the American fans because obviously they have because of Twitter and things you can actually yeah. have loads of friends in the US <laughs> which you then get to see yeah. once a year so I get I do get the appeal of it in that regard and the same with here 
even though I'm only two hours away from London. I have quite a few friends who live in London. I only ever see a Doctor Who event. So it's always nice mm -hmm. to have that about it. Um, okay. But the Gallifrey event is, I love the Gallifrey event. It's my favorite convention. I'm really sad I'm not going in February. You know, I, we may have to go down there. I uh, interviewed uh, Sophie Aldred a couple of weeks ago, and she said she's coming to that one in L.A., oh. And I would actually be able to, to meet her in person. It was so much fun talking to her. She's an absolute gem. And uh, ever since she told me that she was going to Gallifrey down in LA, I've been seriously considering it. But we've got twin six-year-olds. Mm. And I don't know that I could convince my wife that it's okay to put the six-year-olds in the back of the car and take take off 10 hours one direction. We're not mm. talking about coming back. <laughs> yeah. So, uh I mean, I will say what I love about Gallifrey in particular, which I think is something that, or maybe no, I think it's US events in particular, as they do a lot for kids as well, where I feel okay. like the conventions that are here are not designed for families. They're designed for ma big fans. Okay. Um, so like the little events you see, I don't see children at them very often. Actually, when you do see children, it's really nice because they're usually like mega fans. And like I think uh -huh. there's a, there's a family called the Berrymans who I love, um, and they're on Twitter. And it's um, their son Cooper does all the cosplay, and he's been doing it since he was very young. So now I think he's eleven, twelve, maybe mm -hmm. thirteen. And you know he's at that point now where he's making his own YouTube videos and all that sort cool. of stuff. Um, but he's like one of the very few children that we get at the event so yeah. where in Gallif at Gallifrey one and Long Island who I remember there was lots of people brought their families there's a lot of things for families to do so I, as okay. as a bonus I would That's say sure there's there's I, I I found that like, it's really interesting I don't know if it's because it's based in the hotel as well so right. you can just go you know if your kids need to go to bed there is if you're based yeah. in the hotel that's really good where here yeah. you know it's usually a little hall somewhere in the middle of nowhere or um <laughs> so it is hard to like separate yourself from the event if you need to um, right. and also with right. Gallifrey and Long Island too they're based over like three days so there is time for like family events and stuff and still do all the big fan events where here in the UK most of the events are for one day crammed in a little hall um and that's it so maybe like okay. again it it gets treated like a holiday you're traveling all that way you get to have a holiday with your family yeah. but do a dog tooth thing and then you know you know that's what i'm guessing yeah i i appreciate you telling me that because uh driving from here to uh la really isn't all that bad it's uh and in fact we will go to san diego which is considerably past there and and actually drive all the way back up here in in one day. I I think I might actually go there. Let me yes, know if you're gonna yeah. let me know if you're gonna come to a, a California convention, and uh, that may give me the motivation I need. That way, I could actually come meet you and shake your hand or something. That would be really <laughs> cool. Um. So, uh, back during lockdown, didn't you do the uh, illustrations for a uh, short story called The Raggedy Doctor? uh by amelia pond and that was written by none other than stephen moffat i did i did yeah. it, that so that was very strange because i just finished master thief i had just finished master thief i'd sent off the email for master thief and i was mm -hmm. like god that was tiring and stressful it's <laughs> done because it was it was really like really difficult to get that right and i was really like oh. and i i think i'd sat down i i'd you know, my 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 phone pinged and I was like, oh, I've got an email. It's probably just, just spam. And it was the lovely Emily Cook going, hey, would you like to do some drawing for this charity thing for for the um, charity Doctor, Doctor Who lockdown thing? And I was like, uh, yeah, I'd love to, even though yeah. I was so tired. I was like, we need it in like 24 hours. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I was like, OK. So, yeah, so. um which is it was amazing really amazing like I was dead beat afterwards I was like I'm gonna sleep for a week this was insane <laughs> but it was worth it to um to draw these drawings and I, I didn't realize how they were going to set up the video so for context um the little story feels like Amelia Pond's diary but um I wasn't given much of a brief apart from we'd like you to draw from the story make six or seven drawings 
So I did that. And then I didn't know it was going into a book. So uh, one of my friends jokingly laughed. Basically, you are the drawing style of Amelia Pond. <laughs> so, <laughs> so because obviously it was implied that Amelia had drawn these drawings, um, which I thought was really fun. Um, so, yeah, um, it was definitely a very strange experience to know that Stephen Moffat might know who I am. Um, <laughs> and um, it was such a lovely little video. And I was so grateful for Emily to get me involved because I was really passionate about the project. Um, and yeah, I mean, look at Emily Cook now. She's done so yeah. well. Yeah, um, Emily Cook so, was yeah. kind of a kind of a COVID lockdown hero. I mean, so many people yeah. turned to Doctor Who for escapism at a time when we just actually really needed it. And mm -hmm. Emily Cook knocked the ball out of the park right there. And yeah. it's funny that you should mention uh, that about uh, thinking about having Stephen Moffat uh, think about who you were um because you had mentioned someone else earlier that i admire greatly uh gary russell mm -hmm. and you said that you know gary russell i yeah. i just kind of refer to gary russell as god yeah you know, just i just i just <laughs> i can just sum him up in one word i i recently found out that he is on twitter and i'm so intimidated i don't even want to say anything to him but uh <laughs> anyway so all right so um the uh you have edited your own uh fanzine mild curiosities mm. uh dedicated to the memory of Jacqueline Hill mm. where all of the proceeds went to the charity breast cancer now yeah i did that was like my first kind of um foray into um what it was like to work on a charity anthology i okay. think i'd done a couple at that point it was just before the big finish stuff i think um and basically i was a massive fan of ian and barbara they're my favorite characters in doctor who i can't explain to you why there's a vibe about them that i think just they're such interesting characters from the 60s that feel so timeless. I feel like you could put Ian and Barbara in a story now and it would still work, like the the, the concept of them. And um, I just love them to bits. And William Russell is one of my favourite companions and favourite actors. I love him and what he does. So I was like, right, let, let's do this. Let's do this thing. Um, so I kind of started asking around if anyone would be interested and a few friends would, oh, I'd love to. Uh, I got John Dorney to write the preface for it, I believe, which was really lovely of him to do. Nice. And I love so nice. John Dorney's work. He's he's yeah. an awesome author. So we can blame John Dorney for my love of Big Finish because my really? first, there you go. yeah. So um, the Rocket Men, which is a gorgeous short yes. story, um, yes. it's one of the first ones I ever listened to, and broke my heart and cemented my love affair with big finish ever since so we can blame him but yeah. yes we uh, <laughs> yeah rocket from man rocket man is what made me fall in love with john dorney's stories that's actually when i first remembered the name of the author mm. right there yeah i'm like I'm listening to, that's one of the best big finish stories ever and mm. and i remember finishing that and going wait a second who wrote this <laughs> mm. yeah. didn't have no, they I, written I so other much. have they written other stuff because if they have this is what i like right here but i'm starting to see a pattern here of, of charity things um okay so tell us the story about the crazy 14 hour marathon yeah that you did on twitch my god 14 hours um i missed it and i i really wish that i had known about it um but mm. uh i only use twitch for gaming and i did mm. not know that there was some doctor who activity going on on there um in uh, october of 2020 you created an a to z doctor who charity stream where you drew 26 doctor who related pieces of art live for the audience which raised somewhere around five thousand us dollars for fair share uk a charity which fights hunger mm. could you please kindly explain yourself <laughs> uh, I, I feel like that one was so motivated by anger um at the time there was a, a proper a real uh, there still is unfortunately a real issue around um, food and food banks. I think um, a footballer 
uh, here, a well-known footballer, soccer player called uh, Marcus, Marcus Rashford, um, was doing a lot of stuff for Fair Share UK, which is a charity based upon making sure that children don't go hungry. And I was very frustrated and angry about the situation that was going on. And I was like, sorry, I'm going to do something. Uh, and it was really interesting because I tried to do a Red Nose Day event I think a year before and I didn't make any money whatsoever and two people turned up so so I was like it's probably not going to happen but uh, let's say I'll ask people now a bit more in advance and people were really interested and passionate about the project and I was like I know what I'll do so I will go onto the stream I'll set up my drawing and I'll tell everyone hey um, I'm going to put up a poll of lots of different things beginning with a for example adipose or um, as Orbaloff or things to do with Doctor Who that begin with an A and you guys vote what you want me to draw and I'll draw that A and then we'll put up the poll for B while I'm drawing A and we'll just oh, do really? that until I finish really? and that is basically how it went and I wasn't sure how long I would do it for but I refused to stop until I'd done up to Z um, and yeah 14, 14 hours later I think I had a half an hour break um, Wow! and yeah I think it was it was a hell of a day, but it was yeah, it sounds worth, like it. it was worth every second. And it was really nice. I got a load of friends to come on and talk to me while I was drawing. Um, other friends who um ran the polls for me so they could like my my roommate, um uh he lovingly like went through and was like checking the polls and going, by the way, I think you're drawing Barbara next, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so then I could have a heads up of what I was drawing and just talking and it was it was it was a long time but it was so good because literally within i think we, we my i think my initial goal was something like a hundred pounds it was not a lot i was i was not wow. expecting a lot um and then i think by the end of the stream we raised i want to say it was like one thousand three hundred dollars and i was over the moon with the $1,300 and I was very tired mm -hmm. and people were still donating um, after I went, you know, went to bed and the following day. And I think it was, I was having a nap in the afternoon, the following day, I was exhausted. And you get emails saying this person's submitted this much, um, mm -hmm. but they don't put the name. They just put the, the, you know, you have 20 more pounds donated or whatever. And mm -hmm. my, my, my phone pinged and it said, someone's donated $1,366. And I was like, what? Wow. what? <laughs> so I, I, I jumped out of my seat to check and Chris Chibnall had donated. He had doubled what was already in the pot. Oh. Um, and I, I, I Chris Chibnall speak. did that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And cause it was, it was just the name Chris Chibnall. And I was a bit like, Maybe someone's done this as a as a gag, you know. I well, maybe someone just put the name Chris Chibnall. Um, but I uh, spoke to a couple of sources, and they were like, "Oh no, no, that was definitely Chris. He wow. used his own money, you know, and he was so lovely." Um, and yet, it made it made the Radio Times, um, and beautiful. I just absolutely beautiful. So yeah, so I think I think every fifteen pounds that was raised was like one lunch meal for a kid so we made like we just were able to give so much to so many families um and it was just such a beautiful experience uh love to do it all all over again I'm, i mean i'm hoping to do fundraisers next year uh for my surgery but also for other charities as well right, so i'm right. looking forward to doing some more um so yeah well you know you're you're a very kind and generous person and there's a there's an extremely clear, clear track record of that and um you just touched on something that i was just about ready to bring up um your fundraiser mm -hmm. i am fully aware of that uh and uh i want people that watch and enjoy this interview to go to the link down here on youtube underneath uh the 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 uh the screen here and click on the gofundme link um it's called fio's top surgery and um fio is a professional that has spent their time today telling us some really extremely awesome cool stuff 
about Doctor Who that we all love. Uh, Theo's one of us that has that shared gene, and I, I didn't, I didn't coin that. Will Hadcroft, uh, the author of Doctor Who: The Resurrection Plant, he's the one that told me that that we all have a shared gene, and um, let me tell you my my story about uh, Mary uh, Theo. My best friend Mary, uh, I worked with her for several years, and uh, she was top heavy. Mary was very outgoing. She was charitable. She used to work food banks, uh, and she was a kind, giving person, just like yourself, uh, somebody that would go out of their way to help somebody else in need. And she never, for the first several years that I knew her, she never complained about anything. And I remember one time she seemed a little bit down and uh, she said that she had applied for a job uh, working for the sheriff's department. She wanted to become a cop and uh, she got declined. And they said that her, uh, her physique did not meet their criteria. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what does that mean? And then she described it to me and um, Mary saved up. The surgery was expensive, and um, she got it done, and it changed her life. And uh, she started playing soccer, whereas before she had been unable to because she was so top heavy. And um, we ended up uh, that that company that we both worked for ended up going out of business. Uh, we had known each other for about four years at that time. And so we, we ended up parting ways, you know, in life, the older you get, you're going to find out that, that you'll have friends where you, you don't ever just split up. You just go different directions and, and you just don't see or hear from each other again. But you know what? One day I got a phone call, uh, probably about a year after uh, that business closed and it was the sheriff's department. And I'm like, why are the cops calling me? <laughs> and they asked, you know, are you a friend of Mary? And uh, I'm like, yeah, I am. And they said, okay, well, she's applied to work here at the sheriff's department. She's she's going to become a police officer. I'm like, yes. So I I told them, I said, well, you know what? I said, if Mary applied to work for you, you better consider that an honor and you better hire her while she's still willing to do it. And she was able to get to that point because of the fact that she had a body alteration uh, surgery done. And um, I think that it's probably your turn uh, for charity because you've always been out helping other people. And why not? I, 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 I think that it, it's what comes around goes around. And, and you have a clear, provable track record of being generous. Look at all of the stuff that we just covered. I'm not making that up. I learned that about you when you were kind enough to say, hey, yeah, okay, Greg, I'll let you interview me. I had to learn about you, and I'm amazed about what I learned about you. I highly respect you, and I hope that you're able to achieve uh, your goal there. Oh, thank so. you so much. That's very kind, and I'm I'm really glad for Mary as well because I I yeah, it's a it's a very personal issue um right right and everyone's being so wonderful and generous um mm -hmm. so i mean i think we've currently raised i think it is just over one thousand three hundred pounds so far um with, with the ultimate goal to getting to 10k if we can um just to support the i mean the surgery is very expensive and mm -hmm. you know it's one of those things where um the, the more people support the easier it will be for me to to save and any help that anyone can give would be amazing because it will be life-changing um okay so thank thank awesome. you so much for i i, I really it. wish you the best of luck on that uh okay. and and everyone that's watching this definitely please uh give back if you've enjoyed this i guarantee you you've learned something about the worlds of doctor who that you did not know. And it's, and so go, go look at the link down below here. Um, it's called Fio's top surgery. And thank you for doing that. Um, so how do you feel about the current state of Dr. Who with David Tennant and RTD2, Russell T Davies, 
uh, they're returning. And then, of course, Shuti Gatwa. I'm so excited? excited. I'm so <laughs> excited. Um, I think I think what's interesting to me is because, as I mentioned, I got into Doctor Who much later than quite a few of my friends. So my first like real love affair with Doctor Who began with Moffat. I, I watched the Russell stuff, but it wasn't. I wouldn't say at the time, like you were saying, like I didn't notice who the writer was necessarily until I started watching it more intensely and then you know so for me like the Moffat era and onwards were the eras I paid the most attention to in that way um so Russell his writing for me was fine but actually since then and his stuff that he's done outside of Doctor Who has impressed me so much I love it. it's a sin that he did about um the uh, AIDS epidemic here in the UK, he did some amazing, I think, oh, what's it called? You're talking about since his first tenure with Doctor Who? Since his first tenure with Doctor Who. Okay, see, so yeah, I'm not stuff. familiar with any um, of that. There's, oh, I can't remember it now. It's going to really annoy me. Um, there's a really good program he did uh, surrounding a family, looking at the future, um, like looking at like what a family could look like in like the next 25 years, which was awesome um i'll have to find the name for that i'm afraid because i can't remember off the top of my head but like he's done so much there was um i think he did a biopic uh around a prime minister and an affair with a, something there was like loads of things that he's done more recently than doctor who that impressed me as a writer that impressed me just as 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 an idea so i feel like the russell that we're going to get for doctor who now has grown and evolved oh since okay. the Russell we had and everyone loves the that era so much um right. I'm I'm intrigued and excited to see what he now brings as a mature writer okay next you know um, interesting I hadn't thought of that yeah I think personally for me I think that's what I'm really excited to see um okay I love Shooty as well I've seen bits of sex education I haven't seen all of it yeah, I've seen the first series uh, really loved the first series um and he was yeah, just me so too. amazing I've, I've watched half of the first series so far mm. i'm gonna try to binge watch a little bit more of it before uh yeah he's, he's on tv but there's some time i think that's gonna be yeah end of 23 I yeah think. yeah yeah so. um you know and like really excited about the new companion they've just announced uh, millie gibson who was in coronation street so she was a big uh soap star she's only 18 <laughs> Oh, she, my, are you serious? A, I, I yeah, thought she looked a, really young. I saw yeah, that announcement yesterday. Yeah, she's 18, uh, wow. which means it's the first time a doctor and a companion have been younger than me. Oh. <laughs> Only just, but it's, it's, it's like for the first time I've gone, oh, that's that's interesting. I'm sure it won't be the last time, but it was it was just really, it'll <laughs> yeah. be really, really, really funny. Uh, I was like, oh, um, but no, uh, she's, she's quite well known for a soap called Coronation Street here, which is set... Um, in the north of the country um and very popular um and i think she had quite a quite a dark and tragic uh backstory as this character in this soap so it'd be really interesting to see what she brings to doctor who as well um because she doesn't she seems so lovely and bubbly in her um interactions with shooty um I, i'm just so excited i want to see his costume i want to know what the story is i want to know where they're going i'm just I'm, right, I'm, right. I'm just so excited and also obviously we've got david tennant first i mean david tennant was my first doctor i watched on tv right so exactly. for me there's always going to be a little sense of love there um i'm curious at how they're going to play out how he's the 14th doctor now right like how is like having a david tennant that knows everything that's happened after him it's very exactly. interesting so like exactly. ha, like him remembering clara and him remembering uh yeah that actually that's just very strange on itself like it a is. david tennant that knows that clara clara because now he remembers um having all that experience of missy and the master post the john sim master because now and and sasha as well so it's I find that so interesting and appealing. I'm so excited to know what the toy maker is. Is that to do with the celestial toy maker? How is Donna so. involved? I'm so right. excited. Like, right. how is Donna going to be able to know who he is 
without and, her brain burning up. I'm I'm just I right. need to know. I have all these questions. I'm so and isn't excited. Bernard Cribbins in it? He is. See, yeah, that's thought, that's in, that's crazy. Yeah, because he it's, recently passed away. So exactly, it's amazing yeah. that they got some scenes with him as well. I don't know if how many scenes they were supposed to be. I mean, he, even the TARDIS must be wheelchair accessible because they got right. Wilfred in there because there's right. a filming of them all going in. I saw him that. In a wheelchair. Yeah, so, I saw that. Amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, I can't wait. Um, like the, the um, Donna's uh, daughter is a, a trans woman. Just, just it's, it's so right. good. I was so <laughs> excited. Like just, I, I have a lot of faith in Russell um, and I'm really hoping that what we see is kind of, uh, I'm hoping that what we're seeing it's worth the hype, like the hype that's been built. Right. I feel like right. I, I hope that it meets that expectation. Um, yeah, I, and I think hopefully knowing Russell, it will because he he loves to he loves to play with us as as an audience. Yes, I think he loves to to mess us about. So it's <laughs> really interesting to see uh, what tricks he has up his sleeve because I don't think we've seen the last of it yet, and right. that's that's the best part. You know, um, you just reminded me of something when you mentioned that new companion, Millie and, and Coronation Street. Um, we have BritBox now, so I'm going to be able to go and, and check out some of her performances. And you're not going to believe why we have BritBox. Your friend, Georgia? Yeah. Would you believe when I was interviewing her, I didn't know that BritBox was available in the United States? Georgia Cook told me. <laughs> She goes, you know, I don't believe that you don't have BritBox there. And I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe I better check. And here's the thing. The older you get, the years go by fast. And the mm -hmm. last time I checked, BritBox was not available here. Well, mm -hmm. you know what? That was probably around 2015 or, or yeah, something yeah. like that. So we we actually do have it. So um, oh, I'm wow. able to to watch Shuti Gatwa in, in Sex Education. He is awesome. And I want to go uh, uh, look at, at Millie now. Now, let me ask you a question here. And you would know, since you're familiar with uh, British television way more than me, since I just figured out that we can get BritBox. <laughs> um, with uh, Russell T. Davies returning, a lot of people believe that he's going to bring Murray Gold back with him. Mm. And... Um, I'm of the belief that incidental music and music as a whole is a massive part of Doctor Who. Mm. And I think that in the Jodie Whittaker era, uh, the uh, Sagan Akinola's music was exactly what BBC ordered from him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not faulting him as a composer because I think he's extremely talented. But have you seen a trend of British television where instead of it having incidental music, all of the programs tend to have some sort of deep, depressing, undulating sounds? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to think of what I've seen recently. It, it's here, too. It's not just British television. It's here, too, which, of course, half of our <clears throat> television is just copies of what was made over there first. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> it, it seems to be television as a whole has gotten away from incidental music where you've just got this quiet mm -hmm. series of weird sounds. Yet with the David Tennant era, it was big band, band, smash mm -hmm. and bang, exciting music. Mm -hmm. Um I think that might just be more a, obviously less a Doctor Who thing, more a, at the moment, that seems to be what works for the current state of TV right. thing. I mean, I'm thinking about trying to think, the last thing I think I watched was Sandman. And actually, I think there was an element there where I think, I'm trying to think, I guess, I think it depends on, the mood you're trying to set and I think a lot of things that I've watched recently have been quite a uh, bit more gritty right. and I think that Doctor Who itself tends to lean itself more to the to the camp and the adventurous and the exciting so having that sort of music would help so the Murray Gold music is very much that way the big bands the exciting mm -hmm. instrumental music where right. 
I think it'll be interesting to see because like um I'm trying to think because uh, I think the only thing I can compare it to is His Dark Materials which is a series based on um, the His Dark Materials books um, that's popular here and I think popular in the US um, and I, I think it's, it's there's, they're both made by Bad Wolf so if really it'd be interesting to see I think it's quite I think, yeah, I think it just depends on, I think what at the moment, the thing that most audiences have been subjected to or watching is stuff that's a lot darker and a lot grittier, where I've, the stuff that I've been, I've, I've, I watched um, A League of Their Own recently, which is a uh, series about baseball, um, and the music in that was amazing, but it was very much music of the era, because it was set in the 40s, so I guess my brain, my brain is going, oh, but it isn't all like that because League of Their Own was very like high intense music. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I am trying to think. I think it just depends on what it is. I think like depending on what the producer or director wants to right. showcase music wise. And I think just a lot of English things tend to be realistic and gritty at the moment. Yes. Um, and, and, and it's think, happening over here too. A yeah. lot, lot of the things over here. I, I think that, that, that you, and you probably know this, a lot of American television, like I said, uh, is just copies of, of what originated in, in England and the UK. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the trend is the same here. And I know that the, there's a uh, good number of Doctor Who fans that did not care for the Jodie Whittaker era. And I've always, with me being involved in music, and uh, being a radio DJ, um, I pay particular attention to music, and I've always felt that the Jodie Whittaker era would have been much more successful if it had had music which was more aligned with Doctor Who instead of modern television trends. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of hoping that uh, that Russell T. Davies does bring Murray Gold back. Um, so on, on, we're, we're done here, uh, on the Disney thing, you know, that Disney is kind of like, all right, behind, uh, BBC or something. I, I don't know how all of that works and I don't care. All I know is that there's probably a huge amount of money involved and that's probably great. Um, I saw a rumor, uh, online today. Imagine finding a Doctor Who rumor online, <laughs> and it said that uh, there was going to be spinoffs of the Daleks and the Cybermen, and I, I don't know how true that is, but mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that Russell T. Davies is going to create some spinoffs? I mean, personally, I feel like, I mean, years ago, Russell said he's surprised there isn't more spinoffs of Doctor Who since what he did. Um, I think I think this was way before he was ever involved, where he was like, I'm surprised there isn't a uh, Doctor Who universe, like the MCU universe. So already quite intriguing that that was something he said. And then, you know, with the Disney pairing and all that stuff, um, I think that Russell will do what he did last time, which is he will introduce us to new characters um, in, in new Doctor Who. So, for example, um, you know, for, for example, we've just had Sophie Aldred and uh, Janet Fielding back um, in the show as Ace and Tegan. Is it not a possibility that he might now that they've been introduced recently just to kind of, again, bring them back into the new series and then kind of s test the waters and see right. if the reaction from the fandom is enough to go? I think they deserve their own series, but I that might not be the case. That. I mean, it might be that he'll also introduce brand new characters. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, similarly to Jack Harkness and Torchwood, right? We met Jack in his run. Everyone really liked Jack. So Jack got a spinoff in Wales. Right. And I don't see why that can't happen again. So I feel right. like, personally, I wouldn't go down the let's give the monsters a spinoff route if that rumor is true. That's uh, uh, in, in, intriguing, not what I would do. But then... I'm not Russell T. Davis, um, <laughs> but I guess I would try and create new characters for us to fall in love with because that's part of the joy of Doctor Who is there are so many characters to love, so many characters to meet. Um, 
and sometimes one episode with them isn't enough and I'm hoping that if any spin-offs are done it's it's done with that level of love of like well you know this person we met on this planet is really interesting why can't we do like obviously if the format is there because obviously like you know you could you can do a lot of spin-offs a lots of different things as long as it makes sense so you could do a whole soap about a family that we meet in doctor who would that be interesting probably not but right. you can do that right it would depend on you know you could do a whole um just thinking back on doctor who um you can do <laughs> probably wouldn't but you know the um uh the lover monsters story you could do a whole series based upon lover monsters where people keep meeting doctor who related people and having to deal with monsters and just being overwhelmed because they don't know anything about doctor who really they're just following his exploits online right you could do a whole thing on that you might not want to but that it's something that could happen it's just finding the right putting the the pulse on what the fans actually want and what people the public will want because I think what's interesting with Russell T Davis is he is trying to bring the general public in again um Mm. so it's not just fans he's appealing to but obviously we're already appealed right but David Tennant is a household name so people would want to see his episodes so I would imagine if there's any kind of spin-off ideas it would be based upon anything that happens over the anniversary specials that's okay. that's what my thinking about it anyway because okay. that makes sense to me okay very interesting okay cool let's let's go ahead and uh wrap it up here uh to any other young people uh, other young people to any young people uh aspiring writers and dreamers uh people that might have a dream or a goal of uh becoming a writer for doctor who or anything else in life uh that may interest them for that matter Um, With you being obviously successful, what would you advise them of? I would advise that keep going. It is very easy to look at someone like me and think that it's, uh, it's all sorted, but it's not. I've still got my own fears and worries and doubts about my work. Um, I you know I'm an anxious person by nature I might come across as confident but really I'm not Um, (laughs) and I think it's it's very easy to look up to these authors and writers and directors and musicians and things and think wow they've got it sorted because most of them Mm -hmm. probably haven't and it's we're all human and we're all going to make mistakes and we're all just striving to do what we can and the things we love and if you love writing if you love drawing if it's something that inspires you or moves you or like just don't give up on it don't lose that because if you lose that that's when it's hard um losing that thing you love is much worse than being unsuccessful so that would be my thing is just don't give up if you really want something to go for it and just keep loving that thing that you do that's the more important than being successful is just okay. you know I, that's my my opinion on it because it's very e- like it's very easy to get yourself out into the world it, you know you can self-publish you can have social media you know people can see things if you put it out there it's about loving it still it's about okay. being in love with what you do um okay. And that that's what I would I would suggest. Just okay. don't give up on what you love. Okay, that's very well put. And I can actually see that in your art. Uh, you have some of the most beautiful art online. People need to go to your Facebook page and your Instagram page and, and check out your art. I like the colors that are used. And um, would you say that you are a writer that does art for fun or are you a, an artist that writes for fun? I'm an I feel like I'm a writer that does art for fun yeah okay. uh, my art is though I do sell my art occasionally and I do do commissions occasionally mm-hmm. the writing is what I'm passionate about the art is what I use as my own kind of f- form of therapy I suppose my way of in showing my love for something so Doctor Who I fell in love with and that's why I draw from it um, okay. and that's what excites me and I use that as a 
a, a way to kind of distract myself or to think about something that isn't work. So yeah, so perfect. Um, yeah, sounds like it sounds like a nice balance. And I I've seen you turn out some stuff really fast on on oh. on, on Twitter. It's <laughs> it's pretty amazing. You're extremely talented. So. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, such as something that I did not ask, but you would like to answer? <laughs> um, not really, just um, okay. th this has been a really lovely interview, and thank you so much oh, for having thank me. Thank you it. so much. I really admire you. Uh, I consider it a great honor uh, to have been able to learn about you, uh, talk to you, interview you and catch up to you, um, you know, because uh, your name isn't just a part of Doctor Who history forever now. It's actually a part of British cultural history. And I, I didn't put those two and two together and, and, mm -hmm. until you helped me realize that. That is awesome, Theo. That is Thank absolutely you. awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stick around. Okay, let me let me wrap this up. Folks, if you've enjoyed this, please go down to the link that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, check out the GoFundMe for Theo's top surgery. And that's going to be it for today. Uh, good night from the time scales. See you later. Mm -hmm.